This is uh, what we would call the government of the future. Um, looks a little bit strange here, but basically there would be no people in government. Jacques believes that the sooner you get people out of government, the better. The reason being that we want to have access to information, not just personal opinions for things. So he envisions something like this. This would be a, a massive centralized computer system. It would be networked among all the cities on the face of the planet in the center of all the circular cities or, or whatever the, the planet of the city is. Main point being that it's not just going to be in one location, you know, where it is subject to being taken out or taking the system down. You know, we want to have it redundant all over the planet. So it'll be a giant network system and there'll be one of these in every city, theoretically. Rather than having politicians, this would be the Department of Agriculture. This would be the Department of Transportation, so on and so forth. Now, the thing that gave him the uh, inspiration for this was the human body. You know, Jacques looked at the human body and he said, okay, well, this is a very efficient system. This is what we live in. How does this work? And basically, you have, uh, you take the organs individually, say the heart. You know, if you just say the heart, well, what do you do? And the heart goes, well, I pump the blood. Without me, the body will die. It says, okay, well, what do you need uh, to the heart? And the heart says, well, I need oxygen and I need nutrients and I need you know, these various things to keep me going. Okay, then you go to the lungs, say. And what do you do? Well, I provide oxygen to the body. Okay, without me, the body will die. It's like, well, what do you need? Well, the same thing as the heart needs. I need, you know, I need yeah, nutrition yeah. and so on and so forth. And you would do that through every organ in the body. The fact of the matter being that in your body, every organ gets whatever the hell it needs whenever it needs it automatically. Okay, if the organs were fighting against each other like we do with governments and countries and everything we have on the planet right now, if your organs are fighting against each other, uh, saying, I'm the most important and I need more of the resources or I need all the resources, you'd rot away in a month. It just simply wouldn't work. Yeah. You know? The other thing is the, um, the speed of government as it is today is extremely slow. Uh, if, if your body works like government does today, you get an infection in your toe and you'd have a committee meeting in your brain. And a month later, by the time the committee decided what to do, it'd be gangrene up to here, you'd have to cut the whole leg off. So you have to be able to adapt quicker, especially if you're gonna be handling seven, eight, 10, 12 billion, however many we can, we can eventually handle. And the thing is, we actually can handle many more people than there are right now on the planet. We are not overpopulated. If anyone's ever traveled in an airplane and you look out the window, you know, look at it, where are all the people? Other than when you get right over a city, there's all this land. We're not overpopulated. It's not a population problem we have. It's a production and distribution problem. You know, you're growing bananas one place and sh putting them on a ship and shipping them 2,000 miles away, that's retarded. You can build on-site um, greenhouses, hydroponic systems, something like the Omega Garden or, or, you know, various different things. And you can grow them on-site. You don't have to ship them around the world. So... And uh, the whole idea, again, with this computer system is that this computer system will be automated. It will have its tentacles or its feelers out, sensors, throughout the environment, and it will control automated processes like similar to your body. Say, for instance, you have an agricultural region, and in the agricultural region, the water table drops, and you need, you know, you're getting too little water to keep the plants growing. Well, the sensors would let the central computer in that area know that the water level has dropped. The computer would simply turn on the pumps remotely, bring the water up to the proper level again, and shut them off. You don't send somebody out to go turn on the tap. You don't have a city worker go out and do that. It's automated. And if you're talking about taking care uh, synchronously of billions of people, you have to have something at this level. You can't just have individuals trying to make decisions because it just doesn't work. For a lot of people that think, oh, how is this even possible? It's pretty much theorized now that most likely the Pentagon has computers that are can easily handle all this, but of course they're being used for war games right now rather than for something constructive. One of the other things that people bring up a lot is they say, well, will computers control our lives with them? Will they tell us what to do? And it's like, well, no, they won't. A good example would be uh, a pocket calculator. You know, anyone who's used a pocket calculator has entrusted their decision making to a computer. Okay. Uh, assuming that you're punching in the equation correctly, assuming that the calculator is working correctly, um, you get an accurate reading a lot quicker than if you took an hour and a half to do it on pencil and paper. So again, the computer is giving you a more accurate answer assuming everything's working correctly. And it's not forcing you to take that answer. You can do whatever you want with that. It's just a better tool to get you data more accurately and quickly than you could on your own. The other thing is with a computer, the idea is eventually you would meld many different um, disciplines into one giant database and they'd be able to cross-relate to each other. I don't know if we're quite at that computing power yet, but the point is you would put everything that we know about physics, everything we know about engineering, everything we know about chemistry, everything we know about medicine, 
And if you get a cross-relational database that can, that can link all these things together, it can come up with all sorts of things you and I could never even imagine right now. But even take it at a, at a basic level, let's just say we put all the information of one field in for medicine, we'll take for an example. You know, when you go to a doctor right now, you say, uh, hi doc, I got this problem. And the doctor, if it's something major, usually the doctor will say, well, I think it's this. Well, everyone tells you get a second opinion, you know, or get a third opinion. Why? Why would you have to get a second or third opinion? Well, because each doctor has a little different background, okay? And really all a doctor is doing is he's taking his pattern recognition skills of what he knows and is trying to match them to what he's seeing. So he's never going to be as accurate as a centralized database that has the knowledge of 100,000 doctors, including all the little nuances that they've learned here, there, and everything else. And the computer has the ability to do pattern recognition like the doctor would, and it has something to see, like say a scanner. To so pick up a scanner, I got I, my skin, I have something on my skin on my arm. You scan it in, the computer's gonna cross-reference it and go, okay, it's probably one of these three things and work it down from there. You can do whatever you want with that information, it's not gonna force you to do anything, but the odds are, you know, 100,000 heads are most likely better than one, two, or three. So you're gonna get more accurate information. The whole point of all of this is two things. Automated systems uh, for, for production and distribution, that's it, not, not telling you how to live your lives, and uh, quicker and more accurate data from multiple sources, and that's probably the best way to sum it up. So that's, that's the idea of the government of the future compared to what we have now. You can automate basically everything, including the machines being able to diagnose and automate themselves. I mean, okay. it is very possible now that a machine can monitor, your car can monitor all sorts of stuff right now. Your car can monitor that yeah. this part of the engine is down, and so the light comes on saying, mm -hmm. you know, you have a problem with the fuel filter, okay? Now you bring it into a mechanic. Well, hell, most mechanics now hook it up to a computer that tells them what's wrong with it, okay? Oh, then, the and, and the computer goes, okay, it's the oil filter. So the mechanic grabs a wrench, goes down there, does the oil filter, only so he can still have a job. You could have an automated robot do the oil filter, okay? The ordering can be done automatically via, via a network, internet, or whatever you want to use. It could be shipped um, in real time and, and put on the shelves by robots. You don't need people to do that. And it could be installed by a robot and you drive the hell away. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no reason you can't automate most tasks today. And in the future, we feel there'll be more and more and more automated until basically there'll be very little actual work for people to do. The whole concept of exchanging labor for money is becoming obsolete. And that's the biggest problem to the system. You basically have, uh, from, and this is just my personal opinion here, but I'm seeing four things in the world right now which appear to be possibly the nails in the coffin of the monetary system. Now, we've had many monetary systems throughout history. They've come and gone, they've collapsed and rebuilt again. But you have four important things. The first is that in the past, if one country or one economy collapsed, okay, the people who were in charge or rich or whatever you want to call them, the folks on top, they could always run to another country that was building its way up while this one was collapsing. And then they could hear by foot soldiers or whatever, or messengers, how everything was going and how it was collapsing. And they could basically hear from remotely similar, like we'd watch it on TV from another country, go, well, it sucks to be them, you know what I mean? But they could, they could get away from it. For the first time ever in history, in human history, we have an entire worldwide financial network. When this thing breaks down, everybody, including the rich, are going to be up to their knees in it. There's no place to run anymore, okay? So it's going to be... I, you say judgment day, but there's going to be a day of reckoning basically to where nobody's going to be able to escape to anywhere. We're going to have to face this demon, okay? Um, secondly, the advent of automation, of course, is making, you know, more and more jobs go away, mm -hmm. you know? And as the unemployment rate is pretty high in this country now. I think they say it's, what, 12% or 8%, but realistically, if you count the people falling off the rolls, I think it's somewhere like 30% or above, you know, if you don't fudge the numbers at all. But the thing is, that unemployment rate, you might bring it down here, there, a year or two, but, but really long term, it's going to go up to 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. What are you going to do when 80 percent of the people, there's no jobs for them to do anymore? What are you going to do with those people? And the fact of the matter is, you know, on top of that, when 80 percent of the people or 70 or 60 percent of the people are unemployed, they don't have the money to buy the products that the factories are putting out any longer. So, you know, the system kind of collapses in on itself at that point, not because it's wrong or bad or evil, simply because it's unsustainable mathematically at that point. So you have, you have automation displacing jobs, you have an entire worldwide integrated economy with no place to run when it collapses because it's all one now, basically. Uh, the third thing is the open source movement, which is chipping away at uh, retail as we know it. The open source movement, I don't know if you're familiar with, but that's where a lot of people, especially young people, are coming up with fantastic things on the internet and they're just giving it away to people because they're like, well, I'm screwed anyway. I'm not going anywhere in the system. I have student debts for the rest of my life. I'm never going to pay it off. You know, to hell with it. I'm just, I'm just going to give this stuff away for free. I don't care about making money. I just want to make the world a better place. And that's huge. You've probably heard a lot about the open source movement. That, that's 
the third nail in the coffin of the monetary system, and the fourth coffin of the monetary system is going to be 3D printing, and that's huge. 3D printing is a fantastic technology. Um, it's relatively expensive now, but just like uh, regular paper printers, it's expected the next couple years it will come down drastically in price. Uh, 3D printing would also be known as additive manufacturing. Uh, in the old days, they would take a, a chunk of aluminum and cut away what they didn't need and shave it away to get something. This is just the opposite. You would take metal powder, well, the really expensive ones use metal powder, and use a laser to sinter it into something. I think Jay Leno has one. He can actually make engine parts from stuff that was made in the 1800s that they can't get parts for anymore. So he scans in the part that's left that broke. They, they build out the other half in a computer, they, and they actually do it layer by layer and sinter it with a laser and make a metal thing. So when things like that come down in price, right now it's pretty much um, monofilament plastic, I think is what they use for basic stuff. But it lays down layer after layer on top of each other and builds up a 3D thing. There's actually a place called Contour Crafting, which builds an entire house out of cement and it actually lays it down you know, on top of each other layer by layer to build up a wall and it, it's very... With all the plumbing and electric. With all the plumbing, well it has, yeah, it has plates that slide in for the plumbing and the electric that are pre-done and you can build a house in a day without a single person touching anything. Yeah. But the problem is if you implemented that widespread, entire industries in the construction will go out of business overnight, those people will be displaced. Now it's going to happen eventually. The fact of the matter is businesses have to automate whether they want to or not. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a nice guy and you're like, well I don't want to automate, I want to keep the jobs here. That's great. There could be 50 people in your field. The first one of those 50 businesses in that field that automates, they're going to cut their overhead drastically. Robots don't take a break. They work 24-7. They don't need lights. They don't need air conditioning. They don't need heat. They don't sue you for discrimination. They don't need to take maternity leave. They don't get tired. They don't get mm -hmm. sick. They don't need vacations. You know, they don't have any workers' rights at all. And it just the list goes on and on and on. Once you pay the initial upfront fee to automate, your, co your cost of doing business drops through the floor. You become so much more competitive than everyone else. Well, once one business in that field automates, the rest of them to stay competitive have to automate or that one will be the only one left very soon. Mm. So it's a cascade effect. And entire industries are being absorbed literally overnight when the first guy to figure out how to automate, everyone else automates within probably a year or two and those jobs are gone. And the way technology is moving now is exponential. I believe it was Ray Kurzweil talked about um, you know, the, the exponential, you've heard of Moore's Law where yeah. computing power doubles every two years. I'm totally up to date with Ray Kurzweil. Okay. And he actually tracks it from, I think, the 1890s, which is the first computerized uh, thing that was done for the U.S. Census, I believe. This is a talk I saw a couple years ago from him. And he said if you track the curve from 1890 up through when he did the thing, which was uh, five years ago, 2009, he said it's a perfect geometric progression. Geometric being as opposed to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is arithmetic, it'd be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. It's a you know, double, it keeps going up in that manner much faster. So you look at it and, you know, he says it's followed that curve from 1890 all the way up through 2009 when he did the talk. He goes, it was unaffected by two world wars. It was unaffected by the Great Depression. It just keeps on trucking. And so with information technology and with the march of progress and, and the march of events, as Joff likes to call it, you know, this is just going to keep going at the same rate of acceleration, even unless we're completely wiped out by an asteroid or atomic war or something, it should go at the same progression. You know, at that rate, we're probably not too far away from literally just leaving this system far behind. How much turmoil is going to happen between now and then will probably depend upon two things. How educated people are, that there's an alternative to just rebooting the same money system over again, which would be something like the Venus Project, a resource-based economy. And uh, you know the other thing is the other thing is if we don't blow ourselves up first in a nuclear yeah. war or get hit by an asteroid or something. So so really you know that's that's pretty much it. Um, there's a lot of people that say a resource-based economy makes sense and uh, we need to work really hard toward a resource-based economy. Hopefully we can get there someday. My personal opinion is that it's inevitable. Um, I think we're going to hit a resource-based economy eventually, whether we want to or not, because of the biosocial pressures that are pushed upon people, and the society is just going to be forced in that direction whether they want to or not. So it's just a matter of how fast it's going to happen. To me, a resource-based economy and what the Venus Project promotes is something along the line of um, they want to make it happen, but I, to me personally it also works good as a thing to speed up the process that I think is going to have to happen eventually anyway. Uh, you know, it, if nothing else, it will at least prevent the unnecessary death and suffering that would happen if it was dragged out that much longer. But I do believe we're going to end up there eventually anyway.